Mrs. Markram is co-founder and chief executive officer at Frontiers. The first journal published by Frontiers in 2007 was Frontiers in Neuroscience. And according to Frontiers' website, this initiative has arisen from a reaction to the severe restriction of knowledge distribution imposed by subscription publishing models. Just like PLOS, Copernicus and other open access publishers, Frontiers emphasize rigorous peer reviewing. The timeliness in publishing is another important factor for Frontiers that capitalize on high performance interfaces and IT tools in order to simplify the author's lives and to enable them to keep track of their publication. Once more, the publisher does not li limit himself to being just a publisher. He also plays an active role in developing scientific social networks as well as the communication between researchers. It's interesting to online that in 2000 In 2013, <laughs> um, Frontiers has joined the Nature Publishing Group, which is an example of different kind of publishers coming together. And I'm sure Mrs. Markram will tell, will tell us a few words about this. Thank you. Well, thank you. This was actually a great summary. I'm, I'm almost done. Uh, by now. <laughs> um, let's uh, blow this up. So, um, before I tell you a little bit about Frontiers and how it came about, um, I actually wanted to give you a bit of an overview about the motivations where we, basically a bunch of, of scientists here from the EPFL, started and founded uh, Frontiers. And, um, while the entire publishing landscape is now rapidly changing with the open access movement, with uh, different experimentations in peer review, as well as the article level metrics that are emerging, there's still some fundamental problems six years ago and, and still today that we think need to be addressed. So, um, first of all, the evaluation of, of researchers and how we evaluate research is, is fundamentally flawed, we believe, and uh, as well nowadays on the internet out of date. Um, the peer review is broken, it requires fixing. Still today, even, access to research is, is quite severely restricted. And um, one of the biggest problems that's arising nowadays is that uh, the publishing volume is fragmented and really exploding, and I'll be talking about that uh, as well. So in, in order to illustrate um, these problems, and later as well to show you how we at Frontiers are addressing them, uh, I would like to take you on a little journey of, of a typical research article. I'm, I'm sure many of you know it, but nevertheless, just to illustrate the problems. So a typical study, at least in the life sciences, takes about three years. It costs around a million, uh, million dollars or so. And then uh, people summarize all of these um, results in, in a manuscript. Uh, the data, by the way, is, is lost, which is another problem that's, that's coming up on the horizon that's going to be really even an important one within the next five or ten years or so. Um, but that's a talk on its own, so I'm not going to talk about that. But So it's all coming together in this manuscript, and this is what's considered nowadays uh, the scientific output. And then researchers take this, the authors take this, and they submit it to a high-impact journal, because the, the high-impact journal is basically the road to what we call scientific fame. And um, where you publish actually determines your careers, promotions, hirings. It uh, determines how much money you get for your research as well. Um, the problem with all of this is that um, the merit um, of, of a researcher is basically determined by the impact of the journal and not so much uh, by the impact of the actual work. And where you publish um, uh, or, or publishing in a high impact journal is not only determined by the quality of your research, but to a big extent as well on your network, whom you know, what your relationships with your peers are, how well you, you, you know the journal editor and so forth. It's quite a political process and, and, and we as researchers know it quite well. 
The journals, on the other hand, they cherry pick. Uh, they cherry pick just a few studies and they reject the vast amount of, of perfectly good and even great and even high impact studies. And, and, and they go to waste, basically. And, and this is not only a waste of, of research, it's a waste of time, it's a waste of money as well for everybody. So um, let's look at this um, uh, cherry picking process a little bit, at the traditional peer review. So on the road to fame, to this high impact journal, we've got the, the authors are encountering, first of all, the, the first gatekeeper, which is uh, the editor, and she will She's the first one to evaluate or scan through the article, and uh, her mindset is set on, on, on cherry picking, which means that she's looking for significance, for novelty, something grand in your study, something revolutionary in your study. And if she is having a bad day or not really understanding what, where you're coming from, this actually goes straight to the bin. Um, but if she's having a better day or, or she sees, you know, like she understands uh, your, your grandness of, your, of the study, she will assign reviewers to this and they will start writing a review report and in a perfect world, uh, these two reviewers would be completely unbiased but unfor and, and they would be, you know, like evaluating your research basically on, the, on, the, on its scientific merits. But we are not living in a perfect world and um, these people are not necessarily unbiased and in fact they have a conflict of interest because they're competing with you directly, um, well they're, they're, they're experts in the same field, right? So they're competing with you directly for, for resources, for being the first ones uh, to, to publish this particular discovery um, and so forth. So, um, it's not necessarily in their, risk, uh, in their interest to, let, uh, to allow you to publish in this high impact journal, so they're not necessarily going to write a favorable review report, in which case the article goes straight to the bin, uh, leaving you a little bit flustered, unnerved, but hope is what dies last in this process. And um, so it goes, this is just a different illustration of what we have seen today already a couple of times of the article going from one journal to the other where this entire tedious process is repeated over and over again until you arrive in the not so high impact journal where finally everybody agrees that you're allowed to publish there. Now bear in mind that nothing actually really changed with the manuscript, it's still a perfectly sound and perfect and good study, in many cases maybe, maybe a, even a high impact study. So nothing was ever wrong with the manuscript. In this process, easily one or two years are passing by, and in fact there was um, an estimate by rubric that there is around 15 million hours wasted of peer reviewers, uh, scientists' time on this peer review process, and that is every single year. That is a lot, a lot of time. So to put it mind, mildly that the current peer review process is, is fundamentally flawed, this is probably mild, uh, it's, it's highly subjective. There are only two or three people that are deciding about the fate uh, of your study, about this one million dollars and three years uh, of investment. Uh, it is uh, quite biased, it is incredibly slow and uh, inefficient. But there it is, your, your article. And by now everybody is, is, is quite happy. The PhDs are celebrating, the PIs are celebrating, it is out there. And the next thing that happens is that the access to this paper is unfortunately restricted, so you have to pay in order to read that. And um, let's see. In, in 2012, and this is based on an estimate of, on, on Scopus database, there were around 2.5 million articles published. And out of those, 85% had still restricted access. So the impact is obviously not just immense on, on the research and how we conduct our research, but it's as well uh, a big impact on, on economies, on politics, uh, on society as a whole. So, but we, we, we you know, like there is a, this problem is a very recognized problem and, and here sit the representatives that, that are fighting this problem basically, uh, the, the very pioneers, PLOS, uh, Biomed Central, Copernicus, we are all uh, around here, we are all part of the open access movement and open access is accelerating and is accelerating at a faster rate than traditional restricted access publishing. So, this is changing slowly. Now let's look at what else happens to the article after it was published. So, so there it is, this, this little thing there. And um, it is there among other papers. 
It is there among other papers. And if it was, would have been published in the 1960s, this wouldn't have been too bad. There were only a couple of journals out there and not that many papers published, but this is the 21st century. And in the 21st century today, as I just said, there are 2.5 million articles published just last year. By 2020, we will be having 4 million articles published every single year. And in the next 10 years, based on the estimate that we've conducted on, on the Scopus database, we will be publishing 33 million articles. That's just in the next 10 years. Just to give you, you know, like a comparison, in the last 183 years of the Scopus database, there were 53 million articles published. So that means that just in the next 10 years alone, we will be publishing 60% of all the scientific output that was ever published in the last 200 years or so. So <laughs> there is a tsunami of articles coming, and it is quite obvious that nobody can read this anymore, nor, nor absorb this. And, and certainly the current publishing industry isn't prepared for this tsunami of articles. So let me just, um, let me just summarize uh, this background a little bit. So we have a lot of articles, a flood of articles being published across currently around um, 28,000 or so um, journals. Most of them have a restricted access. We have a fragmentation of knowledge across all of these different bins of, of, of journals. The selection process of, of how to publish is, as I just said, quite biased, it's very subjective. Um, and, and basically our society, modern societies, they do depend, they're, they're based, they're founded on, on science and technology, yet how they see the scientific output, the articles, is very distorted. And this distorted vision does not only have an impact on us, the researchers, on our funding, on our, funding, on our promotions, how we conduct the research, but it's also got severe impacts on industry. It's got uh, impact on, on social decisions, political decisions, economical decisions, healthcare decisions, and so forth. It basically influences all, of our as all aspects of our life. So it, it is obvious that we need to do something about it. Um, we basically need new ways to peer review science. We need new ways how to evaluate science, how to disseminate science, and as well, and, and that's one of the, the bigger ones that's coming now in the future, is how to distill relevant science and uh, find the outstanding ones amongst uh, this entire uh, sea. So uh, that is a bit of the background where, where we came from, what we saw is, uh, six years ago, but still as some of the major problems. Um, in a nutshell, Frontiers is a community-rooted open access publisher and research network. We were founded in 2007, so six years ago, here at the EPFL, where we are still headquartered, just um, two, three minutes uh, walk from here. and and. Um, as was mentioned, we joined the Nature Publishing Group in 2013, but that was about all that I wanted to say. <laughs> um, there's actually quite a lot of uh, very interesting projects that are ongoing with Nature now as well um, that are probably going to be talking next year more about. So um, in terms of, of numbers, um, this is... Um, where we are right now. So we're publishing currently 35 journals across 19 academic disciplines, such as neuroscience, psychology, uh, chemistry, and so forth, um, covering more than 250 specialty sections. So these are niches, um, tiny sections of these academic uh, fields. There are more than 30,000 editors on the editorial boards. These are really world-renowned scientists more than 100,000 um, users that use the Frontiers platform. We published um, about 15,000 articles so far, which got around 25 million uh, views and downloads, and there's around 6 million monthly uh, page views nowadays. So Frontiers is really rooted in, in communities, and our mission is to really democratize publishing, to put the responsibility for pu of publishing back into the hands of scientists. And um, for this purpose, we've designed a, a collaborative peer review, what we call the collaborative peer review process. It's a, it's a different way of how to do peer review. Um, we as well use article level metrics, have been doing so since 2008 in order to provide better ways of how to evaluate um, the merits of research and researchers. 
And um, of course, um, we are as well addressing how to distill relevant and outstanding science. And uh, currently, we have a mechanism that is called tiering that really highlights the best of research. And our mission is, is of course, as well, to disseminate science. And we do so via open access publishing, but we as well do so via uh, social networking technology. So for that purpose, we've developed the Frontiers Research Network. And I'll show you a bit about that. So when I talk about frontiers, it is um, important to me and, and to, for this understanding of frontiers, what it actually is. At the bottom of it really is a technology platform. It's a technology platform for innovation and for open science. So everything that we do is really rooted in software, in online software. And then there is a publishing aspect to it and a community aspect. And on the publishing side, at the bottom of it is, of course, open access. That's what we do. Um, but there is more to it, so the peer review process, the impact matrix, the tiering on the publishing side, and then when it comes to the communities, we provide online tools for researchers, but basically anybody who's interested in, in science and academia. Um, we've built the Frontiers Research Network, you will find a lot of academic profiles there, so these are online profiles of, of scientists that are linked to articles and to many other resources as well and a lot of multimedia such as video lectures and, and things like that. So let's look a little bit at the, at the publishing environment, so the, the one side of this Frontiers House. So um, as I said, we are community-based. That means that our journals are driven by um, large editorial boards of, of these top-notch scientists. We really only allow um, people with, uh, I mean, there's quite a procedure to actually be nominated to the, to the editorial board. They need to have a certain age index and so forth. So we take a lot of care in, in selecting the editors uh, for Frontiers. But they are big. As I said, there is around 30,000 editors serving on the Frontiers editorial boards right now. Um, the peer review um, and uh, the publication decisions, they're not taken by Frontiers, they're taken by, by the scientists themselves. So they conduct the entire uh, peer review process and they decide whether to publish or not to publish an article. What Frontiers does is um, to provide the opportunity, the platform, the innovation, the support, but scientists need to take uh, the responsibility uh, for publishing into their own hands. So this is how we form the, the community journal. So it starts in a particular field, let's say like neuroscience, and then there are specialty sections around it. These specialty sections are driven by as well chief editors, an associate editorial board, and a large review editorial board. Um, and then we expand this across different, uh, different fields, and everybody is basically acknowledged as well on the website, so listed as an editor in, in their particular section or in the field journal. So it increases as well their scientific uh, visibility. And like that, we launched uh, journals across um, uh, different fields uh, in science, medicine, and technology. As I said, currently, I think 19 or so, and we're as well expanding. Now let's look a bit at the at the peer review. So these are these are the the principles uh, of this uh, collaborative peer review, which is very opposed to the cherry picking peer review that I described uh, before. So the review mandate is an objective uh, issue. So the reviewers and the editors need to judge the soundness um, of the article, whether it's free of errors and so forth. And we trust that then the evaluation of whether this is a significant or novel study. Uh, can be taken care of by the larger community, but we don't want uh, two or three editors to judge uh, on that. So um, the decision whether to accept or reject the article needs to be unanimous. That means that, that reviewers as well as the editor need to agree uh, whether to accept or reject the, the article. And this decision process is aided by a standardized uh, review template. So we give a very, uh, it's an online form that they have to fill in. It's a very uh, detailed uh, questionnaire where you, they have to fill in a question by question and this leads to quite an in-depth and rigorous review report. And then the, the focus is really on, on collaboration and being, being constructive. So the authors and the reviewers, they interact online in this Frontiers uh, review forum until they actually reach a consensus. So most of the time, 
uh, or almost always, the, the authors and the reviewers, they finally agree with each other. And the peer review needs to be efficient and fast. For this, we've developed our own uh, tracking system, our own algorithms, our own platform. Um, and, and it drives the article through the pipeline. And finally, we want everybody to act uh, responsible and constructive during the peer review process, so no nasty comments and, and so forth. Um, so for this purpose, we actually publish the names of the reviewers and the editors on the final article. So they're, they're there on the full text, online, as well as on the PDF, they are named. Um, this serves um, several purposes. For, for once, that, that everybody is constructive, but as well it acknowledges um, the the reviewers work on, on the article because they are spending, as you've seen, 15 million hours per year on this, so it's a significant amount of work. Um, full stop. <laughs> so this is um, then where, where they interact in the review forum. This is where, where everything, this interaction between authors and reviewers takes place, so I just wanted to give you an example um, of this. This is um, the new review forum that's going to come out in, in one or two months or so uh, on the Frontiers website. It's an uh, it's a, um, improved forum that we've been developing over the last uh, couple of months. And it basically goes like that. First, the reviewer posts a comment based on this uh, review template, then the authors reply. Um, and then finally, the reviewer as well um, uh, replies back to it, and everything in the in the Frontiers review is really um, driven towards um, consensus. The, they need to arrive at a consensus, basically. Um, and it's important to note in this case that, that the mandate is really not on rejecting the paper. That's not what the reviewers are supposed to do. They are actually supposed to help improve the paper, unless obviously the quality is low, or unless you know, like the, the article is part of an open access sting operation and then it gets rejected straight away, as it happened as well in Frontiers, as, as well in, in, in PLOS. Uh, in, in, in Frontiers' case, we actually, our academic editor rejected the article within 20, well, I think it was an hour or so. Uh, we officially say it was within a day, but in fact it was within, a, within an hour of receiving this manuscript, he actually rejected it. So the entire process takes uh, three months. Everything is happening online, as I said, from the submission of the review up down to the publication is driven to a high degree um, or to the fullest degree by workflow. So uh, human interactions are only required at, at critical decision points. And then once the article is published, we have the article level metrics uh, running on them. Um, and as I said before, since, since our very beginning, because that was important to us as well, that, that we changed the way how scientists are evaluated. So it needs to be based on the merit of their articles, of their work, and not where they publish. Um, so you've got maps there, you've got uh, views and download statistics, but besides of that, and, and, and this is now becoming quite a standard, PLOS has is, is, is been doing that for many years as well, and, and others are now... Um, uh, applying the article level metrics too. Um, but in addition to that, what is maybe, you know, like particular to Frontiers is that we as well can provide demographic feedback because we have the network, we have the profiling system, we actually also know who is reading the article, from what kind of fields they come, from what kind of positions they hold, uh, and so forth. And then finally, we use the article level metrics, we apply them to distill the highest impact research. And this is a process which we call tiering, a um, process that we, we invented. Um, so what happens here is that the article is published for a certain period of time, about three, four months, and so during that period of time we apply the article level metrics. The highest impact or the most viewed and downloaded papers are then suggested to our chief editors who scan them, and they select from, uh, from this selection or from this recommendation of articles, they select the, the ones that are the best uh, ones, and then we invite the authors to, what we, to write what we call a focus review. That is um, a review around uh, the original discovery that puts it into a broader context, basically, and that makes it more accessible to the wider, to the wider scientific communities. And our authors, they, they love this process because it, it, is, um, it um, shows them that um, 
uh, how they've been evaluated is, is, is objective. There's basically kind of a crowdsourcing prestige system where many people have said that this is a, this is a good article. And there's ob obviously you know, like a human check, a qualitative control on that as well. So with all of these systems put in place, um, uh, we managed to become, uh, in 2012, already the, the, according to this graph at least, <laughs> the fifth biggest uh, open access publisher, and I believe that we are on track to be the fourth biggest uh, in, in this year. And um, let's look as well at the quality. So this was the quantity uh, that we are publishing. But um, it's as well important to, to have a check on the quality of the journal. So here what we did is um, uh, to plot um, the about 9,000 journals with an impact fa factor listed in, in the Web of Knowledge in Thomson Reuters CSI. And we plotted them basically uh, by their journal impact factor and by the number of articles that they're publishing. And we divided them into the 50th percentile. So these, these yellow line de uh, depicts the 50th percentile. Everything that is above the yellow line is um, above, has an impact factor that is above average. And everything that is to the right, depending on from where you look, but to that side um, of the yellow line, uh, publishes above average um, articles. And then we plotted the Frontiers journals uh, in here. And as you can see, uh, it's based on the official impact factors that we have and, and, and the ones that we're estimating. And as you can see that in terms of impact factor, all the Frontiers journals are actually performing above average. Uh, but what is interesting is as well that um, there is well publishing in terms of volume above average. So if you now, for example, look just as a psychology, so here we are plotting just within the subject area of psychology, the Frontiers in Psychology Journal is the highest uh, in, in publishing volume, and it is as well above average when it comes to the journal impact factor. What does this actually mean? It means that you can publish the body of science. You don't need to cherry pick uh, your articles in order to get to, to achieve a high impact journal. It means that if you put a proper system in place, um, and a rigorous yet constructive and collaborative peer review, you can as well ensure high quality of the journals. Of the journals. It's not necessarily, um, we're not judging the, the scientists based on that. For that, we have the article level metrics, but you can judge the journals based on the impact factor. Now, let's look at the network. It's just a few more slides there. Um, so we launched this in, in two steps, in 2010 and in 2012. The goal was really to disseminate the articles more efficiently. So we have the open access publishing, and, but we want to push them out and, and send them to, to the right people. So the second goal is as well to aggregate them into a more targeted way for, the, for specific people based on their, on their interests. So, this is what it looks like. So on Frontiers, every user, every author, every editor, everybody who registers with Frontiers uh, gets an academic profile that highlights their academic achievements. So uh, we're displaying their publications. They're automatically downloaded from PubMed and other repositories such as Archive coming soon. In Venio, actually, we're working with as well. Um, so it aggregates the publications and they check, you know, like confirm which ones are theirs. But besides of publications, there is as well more to a scientist. Um, uh, so they give lectures, they organize events and so forth. So you will find the video lectures there. You will find events that they attend and organize. Um, and it all comes together in this personal activity stream where you can stay up to date with uh, what's going on in their academic lives, basically. You can follow researchers, they're all there, all the top-notch scientists across currently 19 fields or so. But you can as well follow concepts. So if you don't know, for example, you're interested in, in, in schizophrenia or so, um, and you don't know who, who the people are that are actually the, the top scientists in schizophrenia, then you just follow the concept of schizophrenia and it will tell you then the events going on in schizophrenia, it will tell you the latest publications in schizophrenia. Um, and that is based on the Frontiers publications, but it is well based on, on, on other publications. So obviously there are many more than just the Frontiers publications. So we're aggregating those, as I just said, from PubMed and other repositories too. And they're being displayed there 
in the, in the network as well. And then you can as well follow Frontiers Journals if you want to stay up to date with what's going on in a particular journal, in a particular community. And it all comes together in, in, in the activity stream where you will then get updates um, uh, on, a, on a minute by minute basis, basically, or continuous updates about um, people you're following, about uh, the keywords or the concepts, the topics that you're following, uh, journals, and so forth. So Frontiers is really a platform and, and probably the first platform that combines open access publishing with re research networking. And, and we think that this is the perfect distribution system to increase the visibility and, and the discoverability of articles. The aim here is really to, to increase the impact of, of articles that have been published and to increase the impact of the people behind the articles, the scientists, the researchers themselves. That's, that's basically the motivation that drives this entire network. And um, indeed, when we launched it, um, we saw in the, in the months after that article views as well as PDF downloads, they increased by around 30% and profile views increased by around 80% or so. And with that, I'm going to finish. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we heard that uh, many publishers, open access publishers, are developing um, services for researchers. So I would have one question. Is that is there enough place for all these services? Is it not confusing for the researcher? How do you analyze the market, if I can say so? For all the people, um, plus two this morning, I think, uh, present some of you, but uh, Royal Society of Chemistry too, so uh, Copernicus. Well, I, I think it is certainly confusing, but what is even more confusing or, or worse is that there's actually still so far not, you know, like one place where you would go to find out about uh, what are the conferences in my field. Uh, what are you know like the latest publications in my field or so? So you know, like that type of aggregate platform, uh, when we at least founded Frontiers, it wasn't there. We didn't know you mm -hmm. know like where to go and where to look. Nowadays, uh, this year in particular, there are more and more mm -hmm. right. um, services, companies popping out um, and providing more and better services around article level metrics, around uh, content distribution and aggregation and so forth. Um, but I do think that that. I mean, that is at least the, is the aim of Frontiers as well, to aggregate that in, in one platform. And it is definitely our, in our interest and, and our desire to collaborate with many people on that. <laughs> I, I think also it's, it's a time where people are experimenting with different things. Just having open access to the literature means you can just do so much more. I mean, never before could you think of having a topic called schizophrenia and getting publications, regardless of which journal they were in, in one place. And that's the natural way to do science. It's not to go to different journals. Um, and so I think there's going to be also natural selection and the ones and the services and, and that, that publishers are providing or different platforms are providing um, will naturally die off if they don't work. But I think in terms of, of what Cam Camilla was saying, is, is that the one that will work it is, is where you have a subject and you can go and get everything you need um, from one place, rather than having to go to multiple different services. Mm. And, uh, yes, and um, I would like to add from our perspective that we also... Um, try to display related articles to the ones um, so we have this metric top displaying uh, the article level uh, level metrics and then mm -hmm. we also have the um, the related articles and we also try to really expand um, yeah also the interlinkages between different works and also the, also within the subject area but of course um, yeah since it's, since there's not only just one publisher, um, 
or, um, readers and authors have to look what what is for their subject field the the best solution. And uh, but this was always the case, and I think this will will always also, yeah, uh, stay stay like this. Yeah. Other questions for Frontiers? <laughs> no, sorry. Um, just this morning I received um, an answer from uh, referees. The two referees from, from this um, journal said, why don't you, let's say, look at this job of mine, under, uh, just, to, just to be clear that the bias is always there. And uh, this is not from Frontiers that is trying, to, trying to, to, to avoid this problem, maybe just putting the names of referees after the paper is published. How do you think it is possible to avoid, the, the, in the first place, the possibility of having uh, experts judging your work that are uh, too, too, too much involved in the, in the work, let's say. Um, I think, you know, like that, the, that you need uh, experts judging the work. Uh, maybe, uh, as Katrina as well pointed out in the study, they don't agree, and we actually, as researchers, know that very well. One guy will write, you know, like a hugely favorable review report, the other one will trash it. So there, there is no consensus. But I think, you know, like as well, what the peer review does is forces us actually to put a lot of effort into how we summarize and sum up our studies and, and how we produce our manuscript. I, I don't think that we can, we can or should get rid of the peer review. I think it's really at the heart of, of scientific uh, collaboration and makes sure that we do put high quality standards into how we present and, and uh, publish uh, publish the work. Will you remove the bias? Um, I mean, it's difficult. I mean, these are human beings. It's not robots, right? Uh, it's it's people that are reviewing, writing. It's human interaction. But I do think that you can put in uh, mechanisms into place. So publishing the name uh, is definitely one mechanism that ensures, and we have seen this in Frontiers, that the peer reviews are constructive but that there is well rigorous. Nobody, nobody wants to be associated with a bad paper. It's out there on this paper. Y you don't want to you know, like have your name as the reviewer of a low quality paper. So it actually serves uh, uh, a purpose. I, I was just gonna make a, a further comment that, I, I mean, I think putting the names of the people that accept the article on the paper is great. Um, I had one suggestion made to me that, that the reviewers who also put, who wanted the paper rejected, so they should, they, their name should go on and, and the decision that they made about the paper, so you could see who it wanted it and who, who rejected it. I think the other thing is that there is going to be a shift to much more open peer review um, during the review process, so that the names will be revealed. Um, and for those, uh, the few experiments that have been done, um, where that happens, the reviews are generally more constructive and you can spot the biases, biases more easily. And I think th this is really being led by the, the, the medical community um, at the moment, um, just because there are so, ma so many obvious conflicts of interests. Uh, within that, but I think it's going to come to, to the, the life science as well. And I think, you know, I mean, for the physics community, I think they're already there. Um. Yeah, I also would, uh, would like to support that, that oh, for our peer review system, it's not that the reviewers are necessarily um, named, but more and more journals of, of the interactive journals are taking over that. They say, okay, um, or they also uh, start to open up all the reports after the discussion. So if there were um, additional revisions, um, what did the, the, the reviewer said uh, for the revisions? Though they are also open up afterwards. Uh, that is one step. And I also would really support the argument that if the peer review process is more open, 
So the manuscript, which is initially uh, or like published after after the short access review, uh, tends to be better because uh, also the um, yeah, the the authors don't want to have anything there or, or, or there online, and also the reviewer comments are more really constructive because also the reviewer comment, attributed or not, are online and um, yeah, especially if afterward they are, uh, the names are opened up, then it's, uh, yeah, you don't want to be associated with a really destructive review comment. Oh. Other questions? I would like to, um, to take advantage of having you here in front of me because I, I was not here in the morning, so I hope um, I just, I'm just, just speaking about something that was said before, but um, I, I would like to enlighten myself a little bit more with regard to the specific trends towards um, this open access movement with regard to the publishers and the option that they, they give to scientists because this happened to me lately that um, one article I wrote with uh, some uh, international partners was accepted for a special volume. And then um, it happened that we, uh, well, we had the funds from the Swiss National Science Foundation to uh, publish it as what the journal said, it was open access. We had to pay around 3,000 Swiss uh, dollars to put this article like what they call open access. So it was uh, online right after. Um, before the publication was actually released. Um, even ad in addition to that, they made us pay for having the volume in our hands, like $200 we had to pay for that. And they called this, this journal called this like an open access or their trend towards open access, but we had to pay for that as, as researchers and using, of course, uh, public funds from the Swiss National Science Foundation. So I don't have a lot of experience with that. And I want to know if this is like a trend towards open access or it's just like a covert uh, strategy that uses the name open access, but they just want to make some money. So I just would like to hear some opinions from you with that regard. Thank you. I was wondering. Okay. <laughs> I mean, as an open access publisher, you know, like it's it's. Okay, I, I'll, I'll try to answer this. So, this question. So, um, first of all, you know, like open access. There, there are these different types of open access publishing models, and they've been explained today in the morning. And I think. Uh, Catriona and Xenia, they can as well go into that, but uh, there is something that is called the Gold Open Access, which means that there are journals out there that are fully open access, but they have to as well somehow uh, support themselves, right? Um, so that happens via article processing charges. There are some journals that charge less article processing charges, and there are some journals that charge more article processing charges. But article processing charges is nothing bad, it's just the business model of how this is supported, as opposed to the traditional publisher where you as a researcher usually submit and you don't have to pay anything or at least you think you're not paying anything, even though most probably you're paying uh, article figure charges for color figures and stuff like that, which usually as well, you know, like uh, around three, four thousand, if not more, dollars, so it's not that it is free for you, and where the universities, the libraries, pay a lot of money so that you can actually publish there and, and that the universities can access these journals afterwards. So when it comes to open access publishing, it does need to be financed somehow. So in this case, it's the authors that, that pay for the articles as opposed to the readers or the universities that usually pay for the subscription-based journals. But they also make a lot of, well, not also, they do make a lot of money, much more than the open access publishers. I also think that 
correct me if you were wrong, that, that you were talking about paying an open access, an article processing fee, and then being charged again for... For buying the volume, for having the volume in my hands. So this article is online, yeah, and yes. it's actually the only article in this special edition that, is, that has open access to everybody because the, the articles of the other, um, the, the access to the other articles in this volume, you, 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 can, you, you have to pay for reading yeah. it, right? Yes. And so, so ours, ours is open. Yeah. But then for having the volume, then I said, okay, but I didn't receive a copy of this volume. Okay, you can, but you will have a discount, but it will cost you $200. So I, I was like, oh my God, what is this? I, I don't like the model. No. And I don't know if the Swiss National Science Foundation likes the model as well. No, well, I, I think that's a case where you have a hybrid system. And, and this is the problem with journals that are hybrids that will both offer an open access option and then they'll charge a subscription or they'll charge a fee for the entire volume because most of the articles in there aren't actually subscription. Um, and I think this is part of the legacy uh, publishing. I, I mentioned it in terms of, of double dip dipping. Now, they might have provided you with a discount to the volume. I presume, was it a print, a print volume or was it online? Print. Print. So there's also, there's, there's also another factor that an article, uh, a fee for making an article available online, um, the distribution costs are, are zero for that. Anyone in the world can get that article. As soon as you make a print copy, there's then additional print costs um, for that. And in fact, for some monograph publishing, that, that they don't actually charge article processing fees, um, this is in the humanities, um, at all to any authors, but they just charge for print distribution, which actually covers the costs of the of making the stuff online. So th there's, there's a number of different models there, I think. I mean, ultimately, if uh, articles are provided under a Creative Commons license that allows reuse, which is the one that all the major open access publishers use, CC BY, and all the articles are then uh, 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 made available like that, if they're all available online, you can make your own pre print I in your lab of, of the volume y yourself um, or whatever. Uh, so I think there's, there's a number of, of different things that, that are going on in your case. I think one of the worries is what the license is, is that allows them to, to reuse your, your article or allows the reuse for your article, whether there's an additional print version, which does have an effect. Um, so, but we can discuss this over coffee further if you like. Yeah, but perhaps just to, to summarize, in your case, apparently, you found really the, the worst possible solution of all. The, the full hybrid solution where you pay the costs at all possible levels. There is a subscription cost in general for access to, uh, to the volume online. You paid as uh, an article processing charge to have your open access article lost in this sea of non-open access articles. And then, well, you had the, let's say, the, the premium fee for the advantage of having a paper copy. Uh, I hope it was a good looking copy, at least. It's not even always the case I in your hands. It. You haven't seen it. <laughs> well, let, let us know when you have it. Um, just one small thing to add from my point of view is that this morning I talked about how difficult the choice is for researchers in the current transition because there are so many different aspects to open access to subscription models that you're offered too much choice in some cases without full explanation of what you'll receive. You're given money by your funders, you're encouraged by your institutions to pub publish open access. There are publishers out there who will take advantage of that as well. So what we really need is some clear processes. It's not really about whether it's open access or whether it's subscription-based. People need to have the choice for all of those. What we do need is clear boundaries about where those things occur. Um, also, I, I mean, I agree with that. It, it creates a lot of confusion. And in fact, I've uh, heard, at least unofficially, from some funders that 
they don't want people publishing in hybrid journals where there's a hybrid option because there, there is these, uh, these sorts of problems associated with it. Um, and, uh, but, you know, I think, again, during a transition, it, it, it's difficult. If, hi if those hybrid journals actually help towards converting those journals to open access so that the entire special issue is freely available, um, then I, I think they will support uh, publishing an OA option in an otherwise subscription journal. But it's, it's unclear where that's going yet. Just may, maybe maybe uh, a last, oh, I don't know whether you have another question, but maybe last a comment on that, on that one. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so also with gold open access journals, it's, it's like also um, what was said earlier, but to emphasize it again, for example, for us, every article is published under a CC by license, uh, but, and also can order the print copy on demand, but then it's really like we passing through the production costs of that single print copy. So, and that might also happen if you just say, okay, everything is open access, and we say, okay, you're just free to download the article, print it out yourself, but if we or the printer uh, should do the printing with a nice cover, of course we are charging, but really only the cost this print out causes. But yeah, that's, that might be, but it's not like double charging, but the, the, the online version is free, but in your case it was different. I just wanted to uh, clarify that open access means uh, generally the open access and re reusability of online articles and not uh, free distribution of print copies. And if I can um, add a simple advice the next time, perhaps just go to the library <laughs> and we will try if it's EPFL or the, another institutional library, and we can help you to understand the model of the publisher you, you plan to, to publish uh, with, because uh, there are a lot of models and uh, we can just uh, give you the information. We won't say to you where to publish, but we can say uh, how and which cost will be uh, after publication. So if there are no other questions, um, we will have now a coffee break. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, I just one more, if we have time for Frontiers. Um, as I understand, uh, you have two core business. So one part is publishing and the other one is about community. Um, and I was wondering why uh, to create a, a new community. Uh, I think first it was to support the publishing part, of course. but. Uh, what about the uh, social network community of scientists that are, does exist uh, around the world? Have you thought about working with them, for example, to, to, to do your publishing or not? So when we founded Frontiers, this was already an idea that, that we had you know, like many years ago. So when we founded it in 2007, there were no social networks out there. Uh, so it's only afterwards. And um, for us, you know, like it is a way of combining the open access publishing with the networking technology. We don't think that scientists just like to social network uh, for the purpose of networking or exchanging. It needs to have a value for them, basically. And the value that we are putting into the, why we are actually putting that networking technology onto the platform is to push the articles, to increase their visibility, increase their discoverability, and as well to root them to the right people. So if I publish a schizophrenia article, I want all the schizophrenia people to know about it. So we actually, by default, connect many people automatically on the system. And um, people are realizing the value of that. And so just another one. Uh, and, and what about, are you planning of opening this community to other publisher? I mean, uh, do you intend like F1000 uh, Prime, for example, to, to evaluate other uh, articles coming from another publisher or not? Um, evaluating as in terms of the article level metrics or, or opening up the community? Well, actually, we asked us whether they wanted to have our profiles. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, like, yeah, it's a possibility, I think. I think y y you were not sure. <laughs> 
Um, but there you go. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's something that, that we definitely can think about and um, why not? And as when it comes, you know, like to the, um, so we're very free, you know, like to, for collaborations and, and you know, like if, if anybody has a suggestion or so, why not? I mean, like we're open uh, to that. Um, and when it comes to the article level metrics, we actually run our article level metrics on the publications as well that, that we insert into the system from PubMed or from Archive and from all of these other repositories. So w whatever we have in terms of article level metrics for the Frontiers articles, we run it actually not just on our articles, we run it on all publications that get ingested into the system. And in fact, we run it actually on every single item that is posted on Frontiers. So we have article level metrics for news, for blogs, uh, for, or, you know, like impact metrics. In that case, it's no longer article level metrics, but it's content metrics and similar type of content metrics. And, and in fact, as well, aggregate them for then profiles and so forth. 